let's talk about what remotely piloted systems are and how that is played out on our campus, which has set the stage for this class and all these, these other things. So the takeaways are from today are going to be that um, we're, we, you guys probably understand this, but it, it bears repeating that this is really a crazy time. This is really a unique time that we're in. Um, this technology is exploding. I know you guys know that, but, but I don't think you understand quite how, how special this time is. There's a bunch of things, some that have been decades in the making, some that have been uh, a shorter duration in the making, that are coming together to make this technology really um, crazy and interesting and potentially dangerous and potentially fantastic and all these great things. So, so we want to just make sure we, we, we begin to touch on that. And uniquely, our program here, not, we didn't set out to be a, a drone program per se or anything like that, but through a series of, of interesting events, we, we kind of seem to be at, at this interesting point here and sort of helping the discussion along. And, uh, and that has to do with a bunch of stuff, but it's, it's really this blend, as we touched on last time, it's really this blend of physical stuff, technology, but also approaches social situations and things like that. So it's really this blend of these two things. And uh, this is something that, that I've started calling conservation mechatronics. It doesn't matter if you guys aren't interested in conservation or whatever, but, but it, it's hard to figure out what we do. We're, this technology is innervated in so many different ways. How do we talk about, is it a robot? Is it a this? Is it, and it kind of is. But um, at, least, at least with ESRM, um, we're mostly interested in the, the, conserva the potential conservation value and, and utility of these technologies. And so, so while you could use this for real estate photography and all that kind of good stuff, and maybe you guys will, and, and movie making and all that awesome stuff too, um, our focus in our program is really much more on um, the conservation aspect, although again, just about everything you were learning this semester can be applied in, in all these different realms and different, different industries, et cetera. And then if, if we have time today, we, we'll, we might go through a few quick examples, um, but this will pro we'll probably talk about our examples over the ensuing weeks of how, how this goes as, as, it, as we come to it. So I want to start with saying that the, this technology is obviously everywhere. So I want to go through a couple quick examples just to make sure we're all together on this. So this was, this was uh, the 2017 Super Bowl 51 halftime show that maybe you guys saw. So this is the start of Lady Gaga's thing, right? So that was all drones. So it's pretty cool. Unfortunately, that was all that was all fake. That was borrowing from the Chinese and their and their uh, approach to doing um, uh, the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. So this this was actually real. These drones are real. We fly them, but they the FAA complication, all this kind of stuff. They couldn't fly over the Super Bowl. So the impression they wanted to give you during the Super Bowl is that above the, so the football stadium was closed, they opened the, the dome, and the idea was this was supposed to be, you know, they were filming up into the sky and look at this cool stuff, it's, it's the sponsors logos and all this and that. That was really created, that was really flown first, famously in, uh, this was demoed in uh, Germany a few times with, with, this, with these drones, these sort of orchestrated, um, uh, all moving in concert units that glow different colors, really cool. Um, we tried to do a similar, th a, a small version of that last year here at Arts in the Stars, but we were, we were also uh, caused problems by the FAA, so we, we couldn't. Um, but essentially what they did was they flew that on Monday or Tuesday before the Super Bowl, videoed it, and they just edited it in. So, that, so they, they made you think that it was happening in real time, but the FAA didn't want drones flying over people in the Super Bowl. And so they had um, what's called a TFR, a temporary flight restriction, meaning that no drones could fly because, you know, people are afraid of silly terrorism or horrible stuff. A fantastic, I think a fantastic example of the potential for the, these tools, in this case for art and maybe marketing, but I would, I would think of it more as art, the potential for all that cool stuff. But yet we still are um, encumbered by some of the laws meant to keep everybody safe, and that's cool, but, but perhaps a little bit not yet um, caught up to the times, I would say. What is the FAA's 
you, sorry, excuse me, I'll actually get to that in a bit. The Federal Aviation Administration, I apologize, I should have, should have defined that. So the federal entity that regulates airspace in the U.S. So you're saying they're, they're a little behind, they're, they're not quite up to speed on what we're doing? Uh, I personally would think that, I personally think, this is a personal opinion now, I'm not representing the university or a program. Uh, I think the FAA has their head up their butt mostly when it comes to this stuff. So, and, and again, well-intentioned people, not, not bad folks. Yeah. They're trying to do the right thing. The problem is they've been so slow in, in rolling out the provisions and the, the regulations that they've essentially, what, what they've said is, and we'll talk about this, but our program was slowed for many years. Other research programs slowed for many years. So we were really encumbered but yet the 12-year-old that could go buy you know, a Phantom here and go fly it over the 101, you buying it off Amazon, doing it. So, so it, it allowed, and it also fostered this culture of F you law, yeah. you know what I mean? Like this law is so crazy and it makes no sense, we're gonna disregard it all. And so it really fostered this kind of more wild west and, and I am a big fan of the rebel and the weirdo and the outsider and stuff. But, but maybe that's not the best thing when you're flying, you know, machines over people's houses and heads and things like that. So, so I personally believe the FAA has, has really um, fostered a lot of the unsafe practices by not having r rational things. And, and we'll talk about this again over the semester when we get into the part 107 and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, then this was this past weekend. This was this was uh, my son's Boy Scout troop. We're up uh, camping. There's, there's a firefighter it's supposed to be Mr. Safe walking under. This is a little unique. This is a little um, what's this one called? The Breeze. I can't remember what this one. This is a little portable uh, unit that is about 400 bucks. You guys can buy. And so one of our my fellow uh, parents, fellow scout leaders, he um, just pulled out his backpack as we we're up there. So the, st the scouts are sliding and. And, and snowshoeing around, he just pull out this thing, start flying, and uh, hey. so you know, guys? out in the middle of the San Gabriel Mountains here, and boom, a drone is right there, right? So, so the 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 smallness, the compactness with which this technology has um, uh, uh, come, is really allowing it to be involved in all these different aspects of our life, and so, so this is, I think, where we those of us that are perhaps interested in this technology and like to see us more, we kind of think about this. But it's also important to think of what the public thinks of. So this is the Iraqi army with their Phantom 4. The unit's leader, Lieutenant Colonel Montanar, This is last November. So these are the controls you guys use. This is an iPad. And so they're using phantoms to scout out enemy positions as they're in, in the Battle of Mosul. And so this is no, this is literally just the technology you guys ordered off Amazon. And these guys are using it for intelligence purposes. The radio station is here. We want to clear all this area back to Gokcheni. We will close this area off. I want to secure the residential area. These are tall apartment buildings. So it's very hard to find. It has. It has. So now, so that was that was this. Now these guys are out talking to the public, and this happens. Suddenly, someone spots an ISIS drone armed with a grenade. The soldiers try to shoot down the drone. Once again, they think it was an ISIS attempt to kill Muntadar. The grenade exploded on the spot he had been standing seconds before. Then they spot more drones. Two 
I mean, they really run away, but, but the point is, this technology is so ubiquitous, um, uh, folks without a lot of technical capability and, and all, around, all around the world are using this. So this technology was, in, in, by and large, birthed out of um, military endeavors, like so many of the technologies that we use now, like the internet, like you know, computer controls, all this kind of stuff. So I think we need to acknowledge that, and that's, that's a real issue, but clearly this technology has grown way beyond the military. So now, So now, so now these things, right, this little phantom thing here, is in many ways much more advanced than the military units. So we've crossed this threshold a few years ago where most of this technology was created, you know, very expensive, lots of electrical engineers, lots of computer scientists, lots of aeronautical engineers, all that kind of stuff. And these folks were, um, you know, sequestered somewhere and they got huge gazillion dollar grants and they developed this stuff and, and, and you know, it was, it was hard to do. It's very complex stuff and they were figuring this out. But um, we've really crossed the threshold such that now this off the shelf technology, the rate at which the technology is advancing in the private sector, way, 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 way faster than in the military. The military has expertise in things like secure communications and this and that, but, but we don't really care about that typically, right? We care about stabilization technology. We care about being able to fly from point to point using a computer app and stuff like that. Blow door, we, the, the, the private sector now is blowing doors and, and, at, and exploding at a massively quicker rate than most military contractors. And indeed, a lot of them are now starting to borrow control routines, algorithms, uh, uh, you know, physical parts from uh, the commercial industry. So let's talk about what we mean by things in this class. So we typically here um, talk about remotely piloted systems. And that's because we do things in the water and in the air, etc. Obviously, our class, this class is, is called an introduction to remotely piloted systems, but we primarily focus on the flying things because that's where the greatest challenge is, that's where the, the, the need to be much more precise, etc. Uh, that's where we are. We do have our underwater units, uh, we'll talk about those in a second, but, but really we're mostly concerned about aerial stuff, but because we do have this, this interest that extends beyond the typical aerial stuff, we have used the, terms, the, the term uh, remotely piloted systems. And remotely piloted systems refers to things that move anywhere in the globe. So they could be moving through the air, through the water, on land. We don't have any on land units, but some of our colleagues in computer science uh, work on units that, um, that drive. In, and uh, all of those things we would put under the umbrella of remotely piloted systems. These things can be, as you guys know, very small. It can be little teeny, you know, size of your thumbnail or, or palm of your hand to big honking things, the size of a big truck. Uh, this thing up here is, is a remotely operated vehicle, this, this yellow guy, and that's in our lab. And this was state of the art 20 years ago, right? It's basically a big, uh, or a couple big cylinders that can go down to a, you know, easy about 500 feet or so, and uh, primarily involved with image capturing. So to, to look at the bottom of the ocean, look at the side of a undersea cliff, that kind of stuff. That's literally all it is, is a, is a camera and, and some propellers and things. It's tethered to the surface. Um, and so if anybody wants to work on that for a project, perfect project. So we, it's one of those things we just don't have time to. So all we need to do is basically reseal it up and work on getting the motors going, this and that, and then repairing the tether. And we would have a, a pressure vessel that can go much deeper than our typical units. Um, but this is a big, huge thing. We need, you know, it's kind of heavy, takes a couple people to lift. Most of the stuff that, that we use is, you know, one person lifts it with one arm kind of stuff. So. So, but that, that would be considered a remotely piloted system, as would the, uh, for example, uh, the airplane up there on the wall, uh, one of our um, remotely piloted systems. Terminology is a, is a real thing here. 
as with all things, as with all disciplines, what you tend to get is people that, that want to be cool and people that want to just talk to people in the know like to use their terminology. And that's understandable. We don't have to define things. We all understand what we mean when we use a specialized language or specialized terms. And so there's definitely a place for that. But um, I've noticed in many things that we typically deal with, managing the coast, conservation, uh, flight safety, things like that, um, sometimes people use these terms to exclude other people, right? So that, so that I'm in the know and I don't need to define this and I'll just use all my jargon. And, and the jargon itself oftentimes <clears throat> is not that helpful and it just creates more opacity but it's like you're, the, you're in the cool gang. You know, if you can, under, if you can translate my code, then you're cool. Um, so that's, that's uh, we try to avoid that, but we have to be aware of some of these terms because they're used so frequently. Um, much of this technology, much of this terminology, excuse me, comes from the military because, uh, and military adjacent people and industries and stuff because that's where the stuff was birthed and the military love their, their terminology, right Greg? Love, love all the acronyms and uh, my favorite military acronym were the Navy is, is um, the Naval Construction Battalions. So these are the groups that first put in, uh, you know, airstrips and things like that during World War II. So they were consult called construction battalions. So C period, B period. And then people just started calling them not construction battalions, but CBs. And then that became... S-E-A, B-E-E, -E, and that, their logo is, is uh, of that division is a bumblebee with a machine gun, basically, right? So, wh like, what? So CB, you know, worker B, I guess, or something there, but, but these, these, these terms can take on a life of their own. Uh, okay, so again, we, we typically, the most generic term for those of us when we're talking with folks that have a more technical bent would be RPS or remotely piloted systems. I think people understand what that means, most, most uh, technical folks. The public doesn't. So for the public, for most intents and purposes, when we use this stuff, you can call them robots. That, 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 that is um, pretty good for most general public things. Um, so I have a definition up here from Mary Webster. So a robot is a machine that can carry out a complex set of tasks automatically with limited or no direct human control, right? So, so we program the thing, say with a computer control and it goes and, and does something or, or it uh, has a series of routines where it can sense the environment and respond based on the conditions with some programmed responses. Uh, and I just note that robots aren't exactly RPSs because, because yeah, they're, just slight, they're, they're a bit different, um, but they're close enough for most, for again, most, most practical purposes. We can use these interchangeably in most cases. Okay, so robot for the public. For the more technical folks, we can call these things remotely piloted systems. And then we have a lot of acronyms. So there's tons we're gonna probably hear about over the course of the semester. But I just wanted to touch on a few really quick so that as we're going on the next couple weeks, everybody's uh, on the same page. The first is uh, flying things. So with flying things, um, UAV is probably the best term for most of these, most of our flying things. Again, for technical folks. That stands for unmanned aerial vehicles. I know it's a sexist term. We say unmanned, not unpersoned or whatever, but it's what we have. So um, unmanned aerial vehicle. That would be, the, that would be the, the thing that's in the air moving around. Okay. UAS, unmanned aerial system, is both the thing that's, that's flying around and the control stuff and whatever else, whatever else we need, the sensor package, the control thing, the transmitter, all, you know, all that kind of jazz together. So we usually talk about for, for a typical purpose. So if you're going to go do some filming for a, for a commercial or we're going to go or Chase is going to go map some beaches, all the gear we bring, all the stuff, all the safety, this, that, that would be the unmanned aerial system. And then, then the thing that's actually you know, pushing the air molecules and making the thing move around, that's the vehicle, the unmanned aerial vehicle, okay? So UAV or UAS. 
Other, ac other abbreviations you might say acronyms are uh, RW for rotor wing, and that just means something with a helicopter, something with a propeller that's basically pushing air towards the ground and lifting the, the vehicle uh, skyward or potentially lifting it skyward. Um, then we have fixed wing, that's just an airplane, right? Where the, the propulsion is primarily forward and the lift we're getting is coming from fixed, uh, non-moving non wings. Whereas with the helicopter, the wings essentially are the propellers and, and the, those are acting, those are giving us our lift. Um, another one that you might hear reference to are VTOL. And that is, so we have the, the, the airplane, the fixed wing. We have the multi-rotor or the helicopter. And then VTOL is this kind of in-between thing. Something that starts uh, like a helicopter, so, so can you know, take off vertically, so goes straight up. But then once it's up, it changes some orientation, it ar ar articulates in some way, and it becomes more like an airplane. Rotor wings are great for really stable stuff. When we need some really uh, solid things. So we're, 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 imagine we're floating and we're tracking the mountain lion or, or, we're, or we're tracking the car through the car commercial, right? Rotor, multi-rotors, very stable, can hold our position quite precisely. Um, the airplane is, and, and, and fixed wings are much more efficient at covering a large area. They can stay aloft, generally speaking, longer, um, cover more area, etc. So, so these things have different uses. But you can imagine a situation, and primarily here we're talking about the efforts of nowadays Amazon, that just filed a patent a few uh, a few weeks ago, um, and and these other drone delivery companies that, you're, that people people talk so much about, right? It, yeah, so much about, and so those things are maybe at your house. Those things are maybe at the yeah. Didn't like California government, like the state yeah. government, pass like laws banning drone delivery for California from like Amazon? I thought I heard about that. I know other states allow it, but I, think I haven't. I haven't heard that. They in, in California, Amazon does most of its testing. They have a massive facility out in the Central Valley, and they have this whole network of of. Um, of uh, warehouses and, and sort of controlled airspace and things like that. So they do most of their testing out there, in California at least. I, I don't, I haven't heard that, I'll have to look into that, I'm not sure. I, I heard about that, from, I forgot, I was listening to some podcasts and they were talking about how like, drones are gonna start delivering stuff, people are gonna be able to do their grocery shopping online and all this stuff, they're like apps and drones and all that and not have to go out anymore. It's kind of gonna start eliminating traffic and all that. So most of most of the innovation in this drone delivery stuff is happening outside the U.S. because of the FAA. So there's a lot of stuff going on in Britain. There's a lot of stuff going on in Switzerland. Um, DHL, uh, you know, all these different things. People here. What happens is a lot of times companies will do some. I wouldn't say fake, but um, a a a stage an event and do something like, oh, drop a burrito, right? Chipotle drops a burrito, or Domino's drops a pizza, right? And, and it's not really ready for prime time, but that's basically designed to be an ad for themselves, right? To say, we're working on this, and, and I don't, it's not a lie in the sense that they're not, not interested in it, but we're very far away from, from routine uh, use of, of moving a product from one place to another autonomously. And so, so those things you see are primarily ways to keep the companies in the news and people thinking about it. Um, I'm getting distracted. So uh, I, I'll have to look at that. I'm, I, I don't know any, ba any statewide ban per se, but let, but let me look into that. But, but this VTOL is really one of the, no, nobody's figured it out yet, right? So we, we don't have the answer. So again, like all these technologies, there's a lot of different approaches, but, but I think where we've, we're seeing the VTOL most is in those kind of contexts where the idea is we're in maybe a crowded urban center and we can't just you know, launch an airplane and so you maybe launch straight up in the air and then get to something, say 200 feet, and then you rotate, then you become an airplane. Then you're much more efficient in terms of your battery usage and your power demands. And so you go to wherever you're gonna go and then turn back into a little helicopter and, and you know, land and drop the thing off. So, so that, those are, 
uh, pronounce, pronounce VTOL. Uh, when we talk about things that are in the water, um, we typically talk about ROVs. So our things are remotely operated vehicles. Those things are tethered. So those things uh, are, we have direct control, right? We, we have a, we have a, a line of, of, of electronic communication with that device and it's gonna move around underwater. The other, the other long-term term that we've had for these types of underwater vehicles are um, uh, AUV. So I, I, I know, UAV on the top, AUV, I, I understand. <laughs> but, uh, but AUV, so that's autonomous underwater vehicle. This would be um, just like an ROV, but there's no tether. It's moving based on some programmed instructions and or sensing the environment. So the AUV are non-tethered. The things that uh, the uh, chi Chinese government comp stole from the US Navy um, last month or two months ago, off in the, just off the Philippines, those were autonomous underwater vehicles. Our colleagues up at Ambari take their autonomous vehicle, they tow it out with a little small skiff, launch it at the mouth of the Monterey Canyon, and uh, the farthest one I know they've done is gone down to San Diego and come back. So very awesome technology, amazing technology, still really expensive for the most, case, most parts, but um, way cheaper than a submarine, <laughs> right? Yeah. Kind of thing. So ROV, uh, AUV, and then we have this, this, just like the explosion on the, in the air, We've seen in the last couple of years the explosion, and I'll show you some examples um, later, but um, explosion of the types of robots that, that are on and or in the water. And so we have unmanned surface vehicle for something that's just going to stay on the, on the water-air interface. Um, autonomous uh, uh, surface vehicle, I think you guys are getting the pattern, right? So there's unmanned with a direct control or, or it, it can move on its own and we're not tethered. Uh, and then um, a new term that some of our, our, our friends in San Diego are using for their vehicles uh, that in this case does, can be both on the surface or underwater, a UUV, they call it an unmanned underwater vehicle. And it seems like every time somebody invents a new technology, they want to invent a new acronym. So again, for us, the most common terms, UAV for flying thing, AKA drone and ROV uh, remotely operated vehicle for, for most of our technology we put underwater. Cool? A couple other common terms just to, we'll define things as we go throughout the semester, but just a couple other things that might have, I think, already come up. So multi-rotor is, right, is basically one of those helicopter things that has more than one propeller. And the, the most common one that you guys see in, in, in you know, the public using and the most common in terms of sales are like this Phantom um, four propellers. And so we call that a, qu a quad rotor or just a quad. A lot of times people just call it a quad. Um, you guys already asked about FAA, but just to be clear, that's the Federal Aviation Administration. That's again, the federal agency charged with regulating all airspace from uh, uh, any airspace. So over your house, they regulate that. One millimeter above the ground, they claim they regulate that, right? Um, this would be in contrast to places like France, which um, they only begin their regulation at 500 feet above ground. So that's why one of the reasons why so many of these cool drone companies are in France, because they can experiment more freely at the very you know, low elevation uh, altitude. Uh, and then again, uh, the term aircraft, this is important. So DJI, which is this company, we'll be hearing from Romeo, we'll be hearing from one of the representatives from the company in a couple weeks. So he's gonna, I don't think he's gonna actually be able to come here, but I think he's, we're, gonna, we're gonna remotely presence him in from probably San Jose or wherever he's gonna be. But, um, uh, so DJI, uh, which is the big behemoth of drone manufacturers, right? It's, it's by far the most sales, by far the most innovative technology and sensors and all this and that. Um, DJI uh, is now considered the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world. You know, more than Boeing, more than Airbus, more than Cessna, any of these things. And that's because these things are considered aircraft. 
So when we're flying something, uh, at least in the US, these guys are classified as aircraft. And that's because an aircraft is any flying object capable of changing course uh, while, while underway. So a balloon, a hot air balloon is an aircraft because you can, you can adjust that. Uh, a glider is an aircraft because even though it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a motor, you can, you can swoop and, and move the controls and it can go up and down. And so following along those definitions are fixed wings, are, are multi-rotors. These things are also classified as aircraft. So birds are aircraft too. Ooh, our birds aircraft. Ah, interesting. I don't think they would be considered aircraft. Maybe we have to say a non, maybe we should adjust this definition to a non-living flying object. Uh, yeah, good, good point. I've never thought of classifying a bird as an aircraft. <laughs> Sorry. I think the, the FAA would probably classify birds as a hazard, is what they would, <laughs> what they would classify as. Um, okay, so, you know, again, classic example. So we'll just show a few of these things. So this guy, this is, um, again, a DJI is the manufacturer. And this is the Phantom. This is, again, the thing that when you see anything about a, in the popular press about a, 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 a drone, this is usually what, they, what they're thinking of. This is a Phantom 3. So this is the third generation. We're now into the fourth generation. And the fourth was the one you saw in that Iraqi um, video where, where, where the middle part here is more football-y, more, more bulgy because it has more uh, sensors and, and things in it. But a, a very successful uh, design where we have the, um, the propellers on top, and then we have this rigid cage bottom here, slash landing gear, and underneath there is, is the, the package. Most typically, it's a regular spectrum camera. Key thing here is if we look at this, we can see these little, uh, and you guys can pass this around. Pass this around. Um, you can see, uh, let's, let's pull the battery out to be safe. Um, uh, key thing there with this technology is, is the, the, the computer controls that make it stable and that have this sort of self-leveling technology basically, one. Two, um, the, the ability to make the camera not brrr, vibrate, not be jello and not to go, 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 go. So the, the two most powerful advances were this control technology for the movement of the blades and then um, the ability to have this guy be stable and what you're looking at right or when you guys are pa passing around you can look and and the, uh, the 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 white sort of spongy things there um, are creating a situation so even if the if the main body is is kind of jiggly or bouncing that'll act to stabilize the camera on what's called a gimbal Uh, obviously, our, our Inspire, um, did we pull this out last time? Did we? No. Okay, so we, we should probably pull that and show you guys. But this is our main workhorse. This is also from the company DJI. Um, and, and if you look, in general, pretty, pretty similar, right? We have these four propellers. There's some type of, of thing there that are pointing down. These are, these, are, these are the landing gear, these guys right here. And then we have all the brains and all that kind of crud and sensors and stuff. And then we have the camera. That, or, or the data collector. In this case, it's, again, a visual spectrum camera, high-resolution camera that hangs down. Um, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, you'll see this. We'll, we'll, we'll be messing with this throughout the semester. But basically, how this works is, um, whereas in this case, we have the camera, and check it out. You can imagine we're spinning the camera, and then all of a sudden, boop, you, you, see, this, you see this, right? This guy's in the way, right? You see that. One, two. Um, and as soon as we start looking at videos, you guys will see all this if you haven't already. When you're looking at YouTube videos, a lot of times you'll see on, on the top of the screen, you know, say right up about here and here, you'll see this, you see these propellers. Oh, there you go. You see the propellers in the, in the way. This device was invented to deal with that exact problem. So this starts with the landing gear down. Then when it takes off, the, 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 landing gear rocks out of the way. So when you look, now the camera has a 360 view, nothing's in the way. Um, yeah, so Chase might pull it out in a sec. Uh, another one of our main workhorses you guys will be flying when we eventually get outside and fly is that guy up there. So that's one of our three, uh, so this is from a different company now, 3DR, which stands for 3D Robotics. 
This is a company started by uh, Chris Anderson, who used to be the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. He basically was doing some articles, and he thought, oh my god, this is a great technology. I'm going to get into this. So he created this company, um, and uh, as well as a bunch of other cool things. Um, and this is, this is, this is more the, the PC version of the drone world. Very open source. You guys can get in with the code, mess with stuff. DJI is more the Apple, the Apple world, right? So, so Apple, awesome, solid product, really, really cool, fantastic attention to this detail and design, but hard to get inside, hard to work on the engine, right? Proprietary. Whereas, yeah, proprietary. Whereas this is, at least originally, this began as sort of the opposite, right? All open source. You guys can get in and program it. So yeah, so that's the. So that, that's our Inspire. So this is in the landing mode. So right, you can see from this picture that the, that it, the wings are up. Right now it's, it's in the landing mode. So we, the propellers are just off and, and the battery is not on so that it's safe to pass around. It's pretty rugged. It is pretty rugged. So again, this, this unit is our main data collection um, unit for, for most things we do. Monitoring beaches, uh, looking at birds, that kind of stuff. What's the model? This is called the DJI Inspire. This one that's being passed around is called the Inspire 1 with the number 1. Now we're on to the next generation, um, but we're going to stick with this generation for a little while longer because we have a lot of batteries and things. <laughs> and the new generation is awesome, but it's, it's not backward compatible with a lot of the, the chargers and things. So we, we stick with this. Yeah, Greg. What do these go for? This one now, if you buy this uh, with, a, with a fancier camera, a better camera, is three three thousand bucks. So so this this if you guys want to buy this this is um, my 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 mom got my son one for three hundred and seventy dollars for Christmas last year. This was a thousand bucks. So this is three three hundred something now. Um, this guy is uh, now about three k. Uh, I should say I should say the the Phantom Four the version of this that's the the current current. Uh, you know, one that you would buy. They, they basically stopped manufacturing this model. Um, if you buy the Phantom 4, that's about, what does it taste like, 1,200? The Pro is like 1,800. 1,800, okay. Okay, so the Phantom 4 is about 1,800 now. Uh, this guy uh, is about 3K, again, with a, with a more advanced camera than, than our default one here. The new Inspire, the newest Inspire, the, the really cool, fancy one, newest bells and whistles, that's about 6,000 bucks. So this would be... the. We, you'd probably call this more entry level, although getting up to 2,000 bucks is maybe not quite exactly entry level, but, but you know, as originally designed, this was entry level. And then this is what, using some uh, common electronics terminology, we might call a prosumer. So it's not maybe you know, full on professionals that are gonna live their life doing that, but many professionals will use this. They'll use this to make car commercials and stuff. But this is sort of before you get into the multi, 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 multi thousand dollar unit, right? It's sort of that, that sweet spot in between. I have a question about yeah. the batteries since you just talked about that. Yeah. Um, where would you dispose of them? Ooh, excellent question. We'll talk about batteries in a future lecture. Great question. But those batteries are considered hazardous waste. Yeah, because I, I, even with previous cars, I know, like the battery, once those like, finish off, right. like, We, I mean, the question, us, we, the university, we take it to our hazmat collection site. If you guys have your own, you know, you guys are going to buy your own unit, you have it at home, and it, and it starts to go bad. Um, and uh, most of the cities in our region have a hazardous collection. You either call them up, or you can go to a location and, and drop them off, and they'll take them. They usually have, like, one day a month where it's free. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll talk about batteries later, but good, good question. Um, so again, this is the, this is the 3DR, this is the um, uh, iris uh, up there, and we have a bunch of these. So we were given a, a bunch of these products uh, last year by the company because they like us um, and they think we're scrappy. And so they gave us a bunch of these guys that are at various stages of broken, and we have uh, scavenged them and repaired them. And so we have, these are, these are great training units for us. So you guys can use them. I don't want you to crash anything, but you may well crash some things because that's how it goes in here, and that's all. That's okay. We understand. But we'd much rather you crash this, for example, than the Inspire, <laughs> right? So, um, so great workhorse. Again, this is this is this is. Uh, if you have a look now, here again, it's back to the 
the DJI Phantom style, which is the, this rigid landing gear, and that landing gear is just there. It doesn't retract out of the way or whatever. The default unit here has no camera. This is really designed to work with GoPro, a GoPro camera or something equivalent. So um, you can put the camera on, but the default unit is, is camera-less. Um, yeah, and, then the, and the brains in here are uh, also nice, and you can get into it and mess with it more. Um, other things that we've seen, so uh, two weeks ago we pulled out the, our, our big uh, ro multi-rotor that we have, or that we're working on the um, LiDAR with. So that guy up there, the S1000, that's also from DJI, so the same company that as makes the Inspire and the Phantom. Um, these are some of our smaller, smaller, um, uh, more trainer size multi-rotors right here on the right. Um, you'll see those uh, in the not too distant future. And then again, our, our, our fixed wing. And, and this fixed wing, uh, Chase and, and some of our former colleagues uh, built for us. So that one is all just made by us. Um, we also have uh, these units, which are essentially the same thing. This just comes also from that company, 3D Robotics. So a fixed wing is called an Aero. A-E-R-O is this model. Uh, and again, styrofoam. I didn't say that, but, but both these last two models are you know, not super high tech, very light, strong, light. Um, uh, and this would be, uh, so this is, we just had our colleagues, I was hoping, did anybody go out and see the NOAA training flights yesterday? Yeah, I apologize, they, they didn't give us much heads up. Um, so I was hoping they were gonna come, we're gonna, one of their days was gonna be today, and I asked them to come today, but they, uh, they had something to do today. So, so our, our colleagues at NOAA, we have a memorandum of understanding with NOAA, so we, we can share equipment and data and things. This is the unit that uh, NOAA uh, operates. So this is essentially that all this does is the same thing that our fi that 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 these guys do and that these guys do. Um, it just has a bit more capability in terms of it. This can land on the water. The wings break off, and I'll I'll send you guys all a link. You guys can watch when we were out last year on, on a boat offshore. But basically, the wings can break off, and all the parts are are waterproof. So the, the, you know the battery and everything can land in the water, swap it out, um, and then it has a really cool right where his hand is, Matt's hand is, is a, is a, a camera that, that tracks. And because this was invented for the military, it, it can look at you or, or a target and you can kind of go boop, 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 boop. And then as it flies, it'll stay locked onto you even so that it can circle you and all that. So that's, that's nice if you're looking for bad guys, but it's also nice if you're trying to track a whale or something, right? So we can't do that, but pretty much everything else we can. This is just three orders of magnitude more expensive than that. So that so that that fixed wing on the wall that was about fifteen hundred bucks worth of uh, stuff. If you want to go one of these, you need um, several hundred thousand dollars. Um, so again, trade offs, right? Do do you know? Obviously, there's value in this, and there's times when we need something like this, and this is a great tool to have. But if we're mapping beaches, do we really need a super expensive thing that if something goes wrong and crashes, we need, you know, 50K to repair or something like that, right? Uh, and, then, and then, again, just a couple quick examples of some of the new uh, technologies in terms of the underwater stuff. So this is, uh, again, I'll send you a video of this too, you guys can watch. This is a cool, um, this is basically a surfboard that has a solar panel on the top. We've been trying to get one of these. These guys were you guys are very cool. They, they offered us one of these with only three other universities in the, in the U.S. Um, but we unfortunately at the time didn't have the, even the, the small amount of money. They were, they were really cool. They, they're, they really like us and they're very supportive, but we couldn't quite afford it. We're still hoping to get one. But uh, these are various sizes, but this is, you'll see from the video, this is about, the si this is about from the wall to, to well, it depends on which one, but the, this one we're looking at is about from the wall to here. And it's a big, it's a big fusiform uh, surfboard that has this um, uh, solar panels on it, and it's essentially a platform. So again, not not with a bunch of camera stuff built on. You can add cameras and sensors, but it's basically just a a, a, a vessel. Cool thing with this one that Ocean Arrow has done is there's a, if you look up there's this sail, so the sail goes up and it can help power this thing, and so this is mostly on the surface, but then. When they want to, let's say they're in an area with shipping traffic 
or there's a hurricane coming, or there's some bad guys or some vandals that want to come and mess with your stuff, the sail drops down into the, the surfboard and then it goes subtitle. And it can go down to, I forget, and it depends on what model, but like 30 meters or so, and it goes down. It can either collect data or it can just wait down there until the storm passes or the, or the ship sound dies away or what have you. So, um, do creatures eat these? I don't believe so. <laughs> these are big, right? And, and so, so um, now they haven't disclosed exactly what's going on, but but at least some of their this is a private company. At least some of their companies are the military, and they're making some big ones for them. So, so these things are, are generally speaking too big to be eaten. If they, if they were small, if they were the size of you know a bread box or a pizza box, or something maybe maybe a shark is like, what the hell is that? But these guys are are pretty pretty big. Right. Uh, this is this is sort of a, a, a similar mock-up to something that that uh, Tim is working on for his capstone, but essentially a small surface uh, split hole that we're hoping to see if we can monitor ship vessel and illegal traffic and and um, illegal fishing with. This is just a small unit. Um, this is another version of essentially the same type of thing: a surfboard with a solar panel on it. Um, and then we have some new, uh, some other cool things. And those of you guys that went with us to uh, Hawaii this past um, past semester, you saw one of these in the museum in on the Big Island. And this is basically um, a way. It's a, now this this device does not it stays on the surface. So the main body is the vessel up top there. It's called a wave glider. Is the model of this, and. Uh, and so it stays on the surface. The idea is this is something that can be put out to sea and basically live out at sea for a year, right? For this is, these are designed for long duration deployments. In this case, there are solar panels, but the main movement is generated by this thing that hangs down from this tether. And this is basically a underwater sail. So it articulates, it moves up and down, it's got a baffles. And when the, when the current moves, it catches the current. And then when the current, or, you know, the swell is going a, a different way, it, it changes. So it's both getting movement from this, but also the bouncing of the, the, the tension of the um, a cable uh, is used to power this thing. Oh, okay, I thought I had another picture. But um, so, so that guy's great, really cool, using essentially the power of waves to move around. Downside is it only goes about one knot. So it goes, on average, pretty slow. So great for the kind of thing we want to put out for the stuff that maybe we're interested in and monitoring illegal fishing activity. That thing doesn't need to go 20 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, it just needs to more or less sit there and maybe move around a little bit. Great, perfect for that. But again, something say near a shipping lane, that might not be so great because if a ship does start coming at it, it can't really quickly get out of the way, can't hide. So again, all diversity of these of these autonomous vehicles are really what we need to address a lot of our um, conservation or management or or other concerns. Then we have a suite of things like this. This is a small a, a small ROV. You can see the tether going up, and this is um, of a class really generated to do uh, underwater inspections. This is about thirty thousand dollars. This one, and then we have things that are larger, like the size of a of a uh, Mini Cooper, you know, kind of thing. So a small car. Um, and this would be a traditional um, underwater robot, wow. heavy, on the, heavy on the electronics, heavy on the engineering, a lot of maintenance all time, all day long. This is, this is the kind of thing that you'd have at a, an oil company or a, a very um, specialized ocean engineering research institute like Scripps or um, Ambari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, you know, places like that. Um, so, so really cool very specialized, not easily accessible. You're talking a million bucks, you know, a couple million bucks for one of these uh, things. Uh, and this also needs support vessels. So whereas all the other technology we're talking about, we can launch ourselves, we can launch from the dock, we can launch from a boat. This is something that has to you know, be craned in, let go, picked up. Um, so a lot of support uh, is necessary. Again, we mentioned the uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. This would be an example of those. This is, again, similar to the, 
to the device that was uh, captured by the um, the Chinese from in the waters of the Philippines. Uh, this is a relatively large version. We also have smaller versions of these things. So some of our colleagues at Cal Poly uh, have have some of these, and these are um, you know much lower duration, so so not not can't go out, stay out at sea as long, but um, small capable of moving themselves around and again small enough that you don't need a specialized vessel to launch them or specialized crane or anything like that um, same kind of idea um, and uh, so this so the term for these these units are typically uh, another term I should have put up there is glider so normally when we think of glider we think of something in the air right a an airplane but this this category of these autonomous underwater vehicles that have these um, wings essentially for stability uh, are are often referred to as ocean gliders or marine gliders uh, or underwater gliders and uh, uh, they typically since they're out at sea for so long or potentially for so long they typically will do something like this which is when they're underwater they can't transmit they usually have a satellite transmitter so they shoot up to the to the, to a fl network of satellites and transmit their data. Um, in this case, this guy will go up and down, the, the typical use for this in an oceanogra oceanographic context, dipping up and down and measuring the thermocline, measuring the temperature of the water, salinity, etc. You can imagine looking for pollution, oils and oil and oil spill, stuff like that. And it, it goes through some routine of up, down or side to side, whatever. And then at some periodicity, it goes back to the surface, um, either pops up an antenna or makes the antenna such that it's, it's you know, pointed skyward and then transmits the data and then goes forward. In theory, you can also transmit new instructions at that time. You can say, oh, okay, no, no, we got enough. Now I want you to go over here. So that's a glider. Um, interesting times that we're in. So this is uh, my cell, my old cell phone, um, and it is in one of my uh, protective cases so it looks like a stormtrooper thing or something but um, it's on our blog and so you know when I put this picture up sometimes people think oh the innovation is blogging and things like that no the innovation that's really at the core of all of this technology we're talking about is this cell phone so this really is a magical time so this is the the pri the the amount of money you need to spend to get a certain amount of processing power and it's been crashing. So I have this graph from um, 20, from 1975 or 1976, technically speaking, down and it's just been plummeting. So this, these, our processing power is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's not just that things are getting more, more microscopic, it really is, it really is this thing, smartphones in particular. So what do smartphones do? When you, oh, my phone, where the hell is my phone? When I pick up my phone, right, it's, it's, it's dark right now. I just picked it up and look, it, it woke up and it did some stuff. How does it do that? It knows, it has, it has a motion sensor in there and it's detecting that I've lifted it up. You guys play games on your phone, right? All that kind of stuff. And so the, the, the environmental sensors, the where, I, where am I in place and what's my orientation and where is north, all those things have gotten so miniaturized, one, small two incredibly um, power sipping so very uh, very uh, good at consuming a little bit of electron flow to generate the thing that 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 together is why these cell phones have been magical so we've not just increased the processing power the processing speed we've also increased these incredible sensors that are really low energy consumption the new graphene that's right, and it's, it's only getting better. So again, um, we've seen uh, the cost, the era that we're in now, we're seeing the cost have about every year in terms of our, our, the chips that are inside of these things, and the speed doubling, the processor speed doubling about a little less than every two years. And it's just, get, it just we're on that same track, on that same track. Again, l and the sensors that are in there, l very low power drain, cheap, and increasingly accurate, right? So when you're, and this is all driven by you guys playing games and stuff, right? Because, because you, know, you know, 15 years ago, if I tilted it a little teeny bit, 
it wouldn't be able to detect that. Now, you know, if you almost if you fart on the thing, it oh my god, I've gone off a cliff, right? And so so very 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 sensitive, and so that's really at the heart of a lot of our a, a lot of the processors and a lot of the control systems that are powering our underwater vehicles and our aerial vehicles. Um, add to that the fact that all that whole bank of of 3D printers will probably do, even though that's not the focus of this class, we'll probably do a little talk one day just about our 3D printers. But those 3D printers behind uh, Chase and, and, and those guys, we have the big one on the right is our main sort of workhorse doing big things. The one there just uh, to the, to the, um, in the middle can, uh, is, is slightly more precise, has a few more, um, a little better control in some contexts. And if we want to, we can print two things at once. So it could print an insulator and a conductor, um, that type of stuff. And then the one on the left uh, is, uh, we're still waiting for some parts for that, but, but um, that one is, um, the newest one, that one's from Italy. And that one, uh, the Fab Totem, that can both print like we typically print, but it can also do um, subtractive manufacturing too. So that can go in and after we print something, go and cut Dremel out essentially different parts. And then um, it also has a, a scanning option we can put on there. So we ju I just, Emily, did we, did we order that? Did we order the laser thing for the Fab Totem yet or no? no Back order, okay. Yeah. So then all kinds of different parts on that one. So that one's a more modular type unit. So you can add a laser cutter we're hoping to add on. Um, but then also you can add a laser scanner. So we could take something like this battery, let's say from or, or what, maybe, it was, maybe this was a shower ring for your bathroom uh, curtain, right? And it tore, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, got to go throw my, I'll throw all, create this huge waste stream. Take all the shower curtain, throw that whole thing away, and whatever. Now you can take one of the shower rings that, that holds the, the shower on, take it out, put it in there, it'll scan it, and then it'll copy it. So, um, and, and just to be clear, these things are a little bit expensive, but they're not that expensive. The big one, the big one on the right, that was like 3,000 bucks. So, yeah, so these things are no, they're no longer a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, right? They're in the realm that you guys could have one in your, in your um, or several possibly in your garage. So that's a key part of why we're in this magic time too. So we have the phone, the advances and all that kind of cool stuff. But then we have uh, the ability to do this 3D printing. Now, this is not the same as having our own CNC computer controlled manufacturing machine that can cut aluminum and do all this kind of fancy stuff. Those are awesome, but those also cost like a million bucks, right? Uh, this stuff can, for what we need, for our small units, our underwater <coughs> units, our flying units, this is, you know, 80, 90% of what we need to build, we can build with those things. So again, not replacing the, the, the high-end manufacturing, but almost everything that you guys would need, say in a senior capstone or a project you guys want to work on or one of our contracts with the government or something, almost everything we can make ourselves. And that's awesome. The other cool thing is that you guys can make that, right? Every single one of you guys can come in here and use those printers if you're, once you're checked out. And so you can F it up, right, as you will. And you can try it again and you can F it up again and F it up again, and, and it's only, we're talking about a couple cents, right? That is incredibly key. Too long, so when I was an undergrad, I was an undergrad at UCSB, and the fools gave me the key to the machine shop. So when I was your guys' age, I would go in and my professor would say, hey, we need a X and a Y, and I'd, I've, I've unfortunately become the old fat professor. So, so I used to think, man, why would I ever not be in the building things and stuff? Now I'm like, you know, Chase, go build this. I don't have time to build it. So I've become what I hated. But anyway, so, so they gave me the key. And I used to go into the machine shop and build stuff. Then I went to UCLA and was starting to build a, a thing to, to measure uh, critters in the inner tidal. Uh, and, and basically, as some of you guys might have seen this, but we have, it's a laser, it's, Basically, it's a machine piece of acrylic that you can drop a laser pointer in, and, it, and it, we, we can easily count the things underneath it. And so, very simple technology, not very high tech. And so, I wanted to go build it. So, I went to the machine shop at UCLA, and I said, "Hey, yo, 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 uh, where's the, where's the, you know, drill press? Where's the this? Where's the that?" And they said, "Oh, it's right here. Why?" I said, "Oh, I just got need to cut this up." No, 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 dude, you can't do that. No, 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 no. We're a union shop. Uh, you can't touch that. We'll do it for you. 
And I said, oh, okay. So here it is. So I want it like this, and I want this, and I want this spec, and da 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 And they said, okay, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So what's the accounting string? I said, accounting string? No, I got the stuff right here. He said, no, 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 for the labor. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, dude, 60 bucks an hour. And needless to say, I didn't use him to build it. <laughs> so um, so uh, I made some sort of skanky, nasty version. Um, and then when I went to my postdoc, then I made more fancy versions. But anyway, um, the point is, uh, you guys need to get your hands dirty. You need to take some, I don't want you to crash the expensive ones, right? I don't want you to crash them. But these ones, you guys need to kind of crash those and F them up, quite honestly, right? And then you need to fix them, right? And when we talk about building a thruster housing or whatever, you need to build your thruster housing, right? That's how you guys learn. And too much, because people worry about lawyers and people worry about lawsuits and people worry about you guys being safe, we've, we've sanitized too much of the creation process from you guys. And they say, well, we're going to have like the guys with the master's degree do it or the ladies with the PhD do it. And that's BS, I think, right? So part of the magic time that we're in is not just the technology, not just this cool stuff, but the fact that you guys have access to this. You have access to an R lab. You guys can get this stuff yourself. And so re we, we really are in this time of playing. Literally, it's playing. And some people think that's like, you know, that's not very intellectual or that's not. F it. Playing is awesome, right? That's how we learn. And you guys want to try stuff and get things. Again, I don't want you to break the stuff, but breaking happens. I'd rather you guys break stuff and learn how to fix it and fix it in here than graduate and some, somebody like, so do you want to get hired for my company? Yeah, I want to do it. Okay, well, I expect you to do A, B, C, and D. And you're like, what the hell? I've never, I don't know what that machine is. I don't know how to this. I don't know how to that. So that's, that's really why we're in this magic time. The last little bit, even though we're not a computer science uh, program, we work with our computer science friends a lot. Um, we're also big fans of this open source community. So for example, our open ROVs, the one in the back there that Amanda is working on, um, that the whole, co everything about that is open source, meaning, meaning the, the computer program, the, the shape of the, of the hull and, and the, the specs of the tubes and all that kind of stuff, it's all out there, right? Which means so, cheap. Which means cheap, but also means you guys can access it. And it also means that when we invent something like our, like our rail to put our calibration sensors on, we then upload our design up to the, to the um, repository and then somebody else can take it. They can either just use what we did or they can improve it. And then when we go to look at it, we're like, ah, oh, damn, that was a great idea. We should, let's do that, right? So it's a much more collaborative environment, right? There are, nothing is perfect. There are downsides because then we start to say, in places like here where we have no money and people, some of the administrators say, oh, so we're getting a piece of that, right? Like, no, 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 we're putting it out free. Like, we're putting it out free. Intellectual property for free? Like, what are you doing? And so, so the, you know, but the point is this open source computer code allows for much more rapid yeah. uh, collaboration and, and not to attack anyone or anything, but uh, uh, one example was, um, has to do with uh, campus has to do with now when you log on to Blackboard, our learning management system, right? Now you have to type in your password every single gosh darn time because we were hacked whenever the heck it was uh, last semester, early last semester. So they changed the security settings, right? Now, that's sort of unfortunately part of the world these days, but two years ago I was in a session where we brought in this famous, uh, over here with our IT people and stuff, and we brought in this, this famous a uh, well-known guy, computer security expert, and he was talking about doing, um, so right now, how do you guys figure out what classes to take? Oh, you gotta go on, you gotta log on to the CI records, and you gotta, be like, that's, what? How lame is that, right? Shouldn't you be able to pull out an iPhone, uh, an app, your mobile phone, and kinda, chook, 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 hey, what's open, right? right. That's not, there's not security, we're not, we're not gonna violate your, your student ID number if we have the schedule, right? And so this session was about that same thing. It was about how much of our university content can we make open, right? Again, not people's private information, but stuff like schedule of classes, what room the classes are in, like that kind of stuff. And some people were, yeah, we should totally do this. And, and uh, I'll just say, uh, 
Other people, uh, significant <laughs> fractions, were saying, what are you talking about, man? What? No way, man. You make it more open, then you get more attacked more. And like, that's stupid. <laughs> and the reality is, uh, so we, 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 we didn't go more open. And surprise, surprise, we got attacked. And so the, this guy, the, the gentleman that was making the argument, Kim says, uh, dude, yep, that's what you say. So Walmart said, and they, then they called me up. That's what, that's what Target said. And, right, and so, so for all the potential worries that people have about open source, it's actually much, on average, much more stable, much more secure, because instead of having we 10, 10 folks like looking at it, making sure it's safe, you have, who the hell knows, 20,000 people that are looking at it. And they, oh my gosh, there's this vulnerability. Yeah. Let's patch that now, and, right, and get quick. As opposed to when it's your company, when it's locked in, when it's proprietary, and you dis discover something's wrong, you don't tell anybody, right? You're like, oh God, let's, let's fix it first and see what, and maybe you fix it now, maybe you fix it in a week, maybe you fix it in a month, whatever. So when we talk about technology like flying robots, security is a real concern, right? And so if there is some vulnerability, if there is some ability for some nefarious actor to, to somehow scramble our communication or, or make it do something untoward or whatever, we probably want to avoid that. And so this open architecture, on average, is a quicker response, more reliable, more robust. So, we, so we're also big supporters and big, um, not everything we use is open source by any means, but, but when we can, that's, that's a great thing. And this all falls into this so-called maker movement, all this kind of stuff. So all that stuff is coming together. The processor speed, the ability to, to, to manufacture our own uh, component parts and this and that. It's, it really is a crazy time that, that you guys are in, and, and you're really lucky to be here. And then lastly, and I'm gonna have to, we'll probably cut this off because I have to get to our, our speaker in a, in a few minutes, but um, the last thing to say is we really are in this crazy place. This is a, this is a unique place, CSUCI. And again, not necessarily because we try to make it this way, we just sort of lucked out. So um, obviously this is campus, our campus core, um, but we're really about, uh, whether you guys realize this or not, we're really about trying to encourage new thinking Right now, if if we were a mature university, one, I probably wouldn't be here. They probably wouldn't let me in. But <laughs> two, two, this kind of stuff probably would not have gone in our lab. This would have gone in an engineering lab, which is great. You know, our engineering colleagues do awesome stuff and cool stuff. But it would have been, oh, that falls into category A. You know, this should go there. Or the flying things, that's the aeronautical engineering folks, and that goes over here. Because we're so new, nobody knows what the hell we're doing when we started. So it's just kind of what. So our friends in computer science, they come up here and use our printers. We go down and help, they help out. And it's this very collaborative environment, what, how it should be. Right. And, and that obviously happens at other universities. But because we are so small and because we have fought, we really work hard in fostering this collaboration interdisciplinary, it happens more easily here than in some other places. Um, the other benefit is that we're brand new, right? So again, just like that would've, those things would have gone into whatever place, also, there would have been like UCLA or whatever, right? We would have had a, a, an engineering department or, or the, the, the facilities people would have some engineering thing. They would have already had a procedure. You gotta pay me a certain amount of money. You gotta run this or that. Nobody knows what the hell we're doing. And so we have to make everything ourselves. So we just sort of set it up at, hey, we're gonna be doing this here. So that's a benefit. Um, and um, your guys' diversity is a huge strength, I would argue. A couple years ago, I was running a training for uh, some of our colleagues at other CSUs, trying to help them get their programs up and running and, and talk about how we could do it more holistically. And I put up a slide and I said, you know, one, of the, one of the advantages we have, and I said we have a diverse student body. And this gentleman, not wanting to be mean, but just said, I don't, I don't understand your last point. How is, that a, how is that gonna help us with our drone stuff? And I said, oh, well, because we have a diverse student body. And he said, yeah, I don't understand. How is that a good thing? And I said, what? Are you, what? And so we had this a kind of existential debate for a while. And it was clear he didn't get it. So unlike the traditional university, right, some of you guys are older. Some of you guys have, have worked. Some of you guys have come from backgrounds where your families did not think about technology or college or that kind of stuff. Um, and it just goes on. All those things, I think, are strengths. 
because you guys bring all these different perspectives here. You guys have worked in different industries and this and that. That's awesome. That's not a weakness, right? It's a weakness if all we cared about was designing the most efficient wing for that airplane. Then, right, then we just want people that are kick butt in math and really understand the equations. And for that, those needs, you, you want to have people with these very specialized skills and just kick butt with those skills. We see this technology as aiding conservation broadly writ, right? And so we're technology agnostic in our, in our lab, in our, our programs here, right? If DJI is the most kick butt thing, let's buy some DJI things. If something comes up next week, screw it, let's buy that thing, right? We're not wedded to anything. And we, again, even though we develop a lot of these units and things, that's not really our goal. Our goal is the end product. Our goal is the data. Our goal is the, the information we're able to gather. That's what we want. And so these things are tools for us. Now, obviously we have this class, obviously we have, you guys have to learn how the tools work, but, but our, the reason for being here isn't to make more tools, although some of you guys might be interested in that. The reason is to become familiar with this technology, become competent with this technology, so you guys can go out and use this as one of the many quivers in whatever job you go and do in the future. And so, so that really is um, a strength. And so again, this interdisciplinary, this focus on applied science we have, really field oriented and, and service learning oriented. And as a consequence, we've done all kinds of cool things. And if you guys, again, you guys are in this class, you guys can take this class, finish up and don't do anything else and that's cool. But if you guys are interested, there's all kinds of opportunities. But this is one, so, that, so uh, Chase was here, there's Tim, there's Paul, our, our, our former tech. And just as one small example, this was, Last summer? Two summers ago, I guess. This was two summers ago. This was the DARPA, so the Defense Advanced Research Project, the sort of research arm of the Department of Defense. And they sponsored this, uh, uh, inspired by the Fukushima accident. They said, oh my God, we need robots that can do stuff. Because when the Fukushima meltdown happened, it, the radiation was such that um, the, most of the robots failed. And you couldn't send people in because they would be fried. But the spaces were such that the typical robots that kind of are on a track or whatever, it didn't really work. So they said, let's make a human robot. And it has to go through essentially a disaster zone and do some tasks. Some of which you can control, others of which it has to figure out itself. How to go upstairs, how to, how to drive a car, some golf carts, some simple things like that. And so obviously that's not us. <laughs> we're, not, we're not building those things. But um, they called us up and they invited us to go exhibit there because so few people are doing, so there's a lot of fantastic, Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, all these wonderful engineering programs that are just awesome and, and do that kind of stuff. They're great at building the robots. They kind of suck at doing the education part, right? So again, they're, they're awesome at their very focal thing, but nobody talks to school kids like we do. Nobody talks to the general public. Nobody goes out to the county supervisors like we do and say, hey, how can we help you guys? What do you need? How can we help you achieve your whatever, measuring your beaches, measuring your streams. And so, so they actually called us up. So you guys are in a cool place. Um, and then we'll probably stop here in a second and pick this up next week. But uh, just to finish up this section, I'll say we have some several unique things. So I'll finish up by talking about our policies um, and our facilities, but, but the facilities are here. So not only do we, so this was, this is our barn. So the first class we flew out here and this was, because at the time we were constrained by the FAA, we'll talk about that more in a bit, but, but uh, this was technically not outside, right? <laughs> There's a barn and there might not be walls on it, but technically it's an indoor space, quote unquote. And so we could go out here and fly and you guys could experience wind and all this and that, but, but you know, we're out there. Right next to here, we have this giant model airplane runway. That's where NOAA was testing the last couple days, right? So we have access to that area. Out at our Santa Rosa research station, we have a runway out there. Um, we, know, we are close to the ocean. We are close to agricultural fields. We are close to the mountains, right? We, technically campuses within the footprint of the Santa Monica Mountains. So all these things make for a really unique situation. So Todd Van Epps, who's gonna um, uh, come and, and help us out a little bit for at least a couple class sessions in the next few weeks. Um, a colleague from Fish and Wildlife Service, so we have, we have contact with our colleagues in, in the, the government world, 
obviously Noah, all these partnerships. And so those things really ultimately benefit you guys by, by giving us access to stuff. And again, we, our focus is an educational one. So we're here training you guys in this technology, not so much on the, on the making drones for the sake of making drones. And again, that's, that's different from most programs. Um, a focus on applied research and again this interdisciplinary stuff. 